everybody to, to enter onto the platform. We will be with you in one moment. Good evening. Good evening, lovely to see you all. Thank you for joining. Again, please bear with us while everybody enters the room, the Zoom room. Fantastic, wonderful to see everybody here this evening. Little bit of housekeeping, could I please remind everybody to keep their devices on mute. Please ensure that throughout the lecture and the musical performance on mute, so we don't disturb our professionals tonight. It is a wonderful opportunity to see you all, to see you nice and to see you well and to see you joining us, the ZF and the WZO, who are hugely grateful for you helping us celebrate this evening tonight. Could I remind everybody, please, to put their devices onto mute. Please ensure it's on mute and then we, we, we're going to start now. So tonight, we are hugely proud to host an evening about Chana Sinesh, a famous Zionist pioneer, a wonderful, hero, a heroic female, one of the few famous female heroines from the past century, a fighter like no other, a paratrooper that landed in Hungary during the war to save Jews, simply putting her own life at risk. So I'm not going to talk too much about Hannah Senich. Some of you have visited Kibbutz Stotiam in Kesaria, where her memorial is and her museum is. But tonight we are proud to host Dr. Tuvia Book, who will tell us a lot more about Hannah Senich and her life. Uh, we were also hugely grateful to host Yuval Chavkin and Noah Bodner, our musical expert. Yuval is an accomplished musician, a composer and performer and founder and musical director of the highly acclaimed Kedma band. Noah Bodner is a British-Israeli national living in London, a prolif prolific theatre actress and an accomplished singer-musician. And they will, throughout this evening, play a little bit of music, both from Hannah herself and music about, about Israel. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tuvia Book. Dr. Tuvia Book was born in London and raised both in UK and South Africa, fellow South Africa. After making Aliyah at the age of 17, he studied in Yeshiva and volunteered for the IDF where he served in an elite combat unit. Upon his discharge, he completed his Bari Lun University BA as well as a certification in graphic design. He served as the information officer in, at the Israeli consulate in Philadelphia while earning a graduate degree in Jewish studies. Upon his return to Israel, Dr. Book graduated from a course of study within the Israeli Ministry of Tourism, which is a very tough course, I have to say, and is a licensed tour guide who will tour us tonight, help us, guide us around Hannah Senesh and her life. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to our musicians who will help us enjoy this evening spiritually and then to Dr. Tuvia Book. Now I remind everybody, first a huge thanks to the ZF and the WZO who made this evening possible. Secondly, if you have questions for Dr. Tuvia Book, there is a button, a chat button, which you are welcome to explore, to use, to post your questions. And we will try and get to as many questions as we possibly can. At the end of, of Dr. Tuvia Book's um, a lecture tonight, we will have a further musical expert from our two wonderful musicians. Thank you so much and welcome. Uh, can you see her? Good, good evening. If we can please have the screen on the, our little TV studio here. Hi. We can see you and hear you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Shalom.
שלא ייגמר לעולם. החול והים, רישוש של המים, ורק השמיים, תפילת האדם, החול והים, רישוש של המים, ורק השמיים, תפילת האדם. This one, this song was, of course, uh, Hannah's was a very the most famous song by Hannah Senesh. And as we wanted to be a little bit also lighter, a little bit, we chose to do something more lighter that is connected to her hum Hungarian um, heritage. Heritage, yes. So that's like something a little bit lively f uh, with Noah on the her expertise on her harmonica. Let's yeah, good luck to us. <laughs> Thank you. 
you very much, and we're looking forward um, to do our uh, major longest uh, concert just after the lecture. So we're going to looking forward to um, seeing you um, in about, uh, I guess, 45 minutes. Thank you. See you later. Okay. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now that you're all said yes, you can all candy mute your microphones and I'm with you. So as Paul said his introduction, as a fellow landsman, uh, he was talking about the South African component, uh, and also this is part of the English Zionist Federation. But my real emotional connection tonight, of course, is that my late grandmother, Charlotte Goldman, was actually from Hungary as well. So I also have the Hungarian blood as well, from a small little town on the border of Slovakia called Chateau Yehuhe. So you can only say that if your family comes from there, otherwise nobody can pronounce it. So we have these uh, Hungarian roots in my own family as well, which makes the story also that element of a personal uh, connection. So I wanted to start today by mentioning that today, actually, we are marking the yacht site, the, uh, the 76th anniversary of Hannah entering uh, eternity, which is one of the reasons why we chose this particular uh, date, uh, not what we normally do when you go to a Yom Hashanah, to a yacht site or to a Shiva house, you don't talk about how the person died, but rather how they lived and what they lived for. So we will be celebrating uh, Hannah's uh, entering into eternity by celebrating her life as we already started with music. Now, usually when I do these presentations, I have some uh, music off the internet, which I can play. So today has been a real honor and privilege to have such fantastic live music as well making the whole uh, experience much more uh, central. So we started off with two songs, her most famous song, the Eli Eli, a uh, very poignant, sad song, almost full of foreshadowing of, of what is important in life, what's not important. And again, it doesn't matter how long one lives or what one lives for. And afterwards we had a very bright uh, Hungarian folk dance tune as well. So Hanna Senesh, um, was basically somebody who um, there's a hashtag called Jewish privilege. It's used rather ironically. It's basically say, oh, the Jews, they have so many advantages uh, and therefore they have Jewish privilege. But actually, uh, in reality, it's very different. Jewish privilege is when you're denied an honor because you're a Jew. And in this case, this was Hannah's start of her short but brief and powerful life. Uh, in Hebrew, there's an expression called the rega emet. In English, it's called the moment of truth. And Hannah's moment of truth happened when she was 16. It happened in high school in Budapest. Hannah grew up very, very assimilated, but deeply Hungarian cultured family. In fact, her late father, mm -hmm. her father, Bela Senesh, was a famous Hungarian playwright, who unfortunately died very young when Hannah was just a little girl. And she was raised by her mother and her grandmother with her brother, uh, George Gyorda, also with them, uh, in a beautiful suburb in, um, in the Pest side of Budapest. I actually went to a house last year. Stunning. She went to a school. It wasn't a Jewish school. In fact, um, even though it wasn't a Jewish school, it was a Protestant school, a private school, um, already the Jew privilege kicked in because for her mother, Katerina, to send her there, she had to pay twice the amount of uh, money to go to, to go to that school because her daughter was Jewish. So that's where the Jew privilege kicked in. When she was 16, she was elected to be the class president. She was a very popular young girl. She was extremely uh, literary. She was good at sports. She had a rich social life as well. She's the kind of person who in Israel today, if she was in high school, would have been picked to try out for the pilot's course. She would have got a Zimun Latais uh, tried out for the pilot's course because she fit all the credentials. She was academically smart. She was socially with it. She was incredibly uh, fit. So she was both what we call a nerd and a jock. Uh, and basically, no one was surprised when she was elected to be the class president. What there was a surprise is when the teacher said, I'm very sorry, but you cannot receive that honor. So she said, why not? Just because you're a Jew. And this is Hungary in 1938, because you are a Jew. Now, what very few people realize is that in pre-war Hungary, 
intermarriage rate was almost the rate that it was in pre-war Germany. It was running about 80% of Hungarian Jews felt a lot more Hungarian than they felt Jewish and were marrying out of the faith because they felt themselves to be Hungarian of the mosaic persuasion, Hungarian first and Jewish very much second. And Hannah had grown up like that. She'd grown up very assimilated. She never had a Jewish boyfriend. She didn't even go to synagogue to shul on Yom Kippur. So she would have been also been a classic birthright candidate as well. A very, very non-affiliated. And she was told, oh, because you're a Jew, you come with a class president. So what I wrote down over here are the three options she could have taken. She could have said, c'est la vie, that's life. En my last thought, I'm a Jew. She could have said, if you can't beat them, join them, which many Hungarian Jews did take that option, which is convert. Even not in Hungary, all through Europe. Gustav Mahler, for example, the famous uh, Austrian composer, when he was told he couldn't leave the Australian, Austrian Philharmonic if he was a Jew, there was a simple good solution, that's convert to Christianity, so he did. Even the vaulted Zionist Theodor Herzl, believe it or not, before he saw the light, he also had an idea, maybe we should just all convert to Christianity and have a mass baptism, and therefore no one's gonna hate us anymore. Uh, the Dreyfus trial obviously changed his uh, opinion on that one, because uh, no matter how assimilated you are, you're still a Jew. So Hannah, to her credit, and this is what shaped the course of the rest of her brief but powerful life, she took option three. She said, wait a second, they just call me a Jew. I don't even know what it means to be a Jew. I thought I was Hungarian. She was smart, she already spoke at this stage when she was 16, Hungarian, German, French, and English, fluent in four languages. She said, what the heck, let me add another language. She spent the next year of her life, between the age of 16 and 17, teaching herself to read, write, and speak Hebrew, which is just phenomenal. When you think about today, my doctorate, by the way, is in education, and I've studied the Jewish day school world for many years, and I can tell you that students can go through 12 years of Jewish day school and still not be able to speak Hebrew. And here's Hannah Selish, motivated beyond belief, taught herself to read, write, and speak Hebrew from scratch in less than a year. What do we learn about this? If there's a will, there's a way. Not only did she teach herself Hebrew, which she thought was the key to being a Jew, she also studied about Judaism itself. What does it even mean to be a Jew? What is Judaism actually about? If I'm gonna be denied an honor and insulted because I'm a Jew, at least let me know what it's about. When she was 17, she wrote the following entry in her diary that I'm about to show you. Now again, I'm reminding you, this is 17 years of age. This is the conclusion Hannah Senesh came to. I don't know whether I've mentioned this. She wrote this in 1938. I don't know whether I've mentioned this. Whoops, let me go back. Uh, but I've, I have to, I, you're all in the way of my uh, screen. I need to move you guys. I don't know whether I've mentioned, uh, I've already mentioned that I've become a Zionist. This word stands a tremendous number of things. To me, it means in short, that I'm consciously and strongly feel that I am a Jew and proud of it. Before this, of course, she was just a Jew, but didn't know what it even meant. Then she concludes, and this is a long entry. I just took two excerpts from it. One needs something to believe in, something for which one has a, can have a whole heart enthusiasm. One needs to feel that one's life has meaning, that one is needed in this world. Zionism fulfills that for me. Now today, when you mention Zionism, you can get some blank, blank looks, sometimes even hostile looks on various university campuses. And um, till 1948, Zionism was just one word, a one sentence definition, the wish to establish a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. That's simple. The question today in the year 2020 is what is Zionism today? And um, my doctoral research, believe it or not, was actually on interviewing soldiers who take part on the birthright programs, the Mifgash program, cross-cultural prayer education. And one of the questions I always ask them is, what does it mean for you today to be an Israeli, to be a Jew? And you'd be amazed about all the different answers today. But for Hannah Senesh, it was clear and succinct. I need to have a meaning in my life. And Zionism gives my life meaning. It gives me pride as a Jew and as a Zionist. Now, if you want to be a purist, what do you think Hannah Senesh's next step was after this diary entry at the age of 17? 
Now, let me tell you, if she wouldn't have been elected class president, she would have done what she was going to do, which was finish high school with honors, go to top university and enter the European intelligentsia. Instead, because of this life defining moment, she says, wait a second, even with all of my education and culture, I see myself as a Zionist. Next slide, no one's gonna be surprised. There's one place in the world, she wrote, to which you do not escape, nor do you emigrate. You come home, the land of Israel, pure and simple. We all know there's many different forms of Zionism. You can support Israel from the diaspora. You can visit Israel. You can serve in the army as a volunteer. There's a program called Machal Midnadvei Chutz Laaretz. You can give donations. You can listen to Zionist Federation of UK talks and, um, and educate yourself. You could be connected. You can have a holiday home. You can visit. Many different ways to show your love and appreciation. You can make the case for Israel on a university campus or work. And yet, as far as Hannah Senesh was concerned, if you want to be a purist, you need to come home. You need to understand that the future of the Jewish people would only be played out in one place, and that is the land of Israel. And she said, yeah, I can't not go, or else I'll be a hypocrite. I've read her diary, and she, 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 she said, wow, I've got to leave everything behind, everything I know, hungry, my mother. She was very close to her mother, my brother. But if you can't just talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. And we just read a few weeks ago in the Torah, Lech Lecha, you've got to go yourself. You can't say someone else, this is the right thing to do, but let someone else do it. So Hannah said, if I'm going to be a Zionist, I need to go myself. An incredible, brave woman. Normally you think of heroes as people with battle axes. In this case, she was had the bravery to follow her convictions, even though it meant going totally by herself, a land she'd never been, but she felt she'd been there in her past. And here's a picture of young Hannah in Israel. The famous pictures you see of Hannah Senesh are always wearing a uniform. I happen to really like this picture. This is on a Moshe called Nahala. Now, can you imagine this young girl with soft hands, speaks five languages, top high school graduation, as white collar as you can possibly imagine from an affluent Hungarian home, saying, well, if I'm already going to go to Israel, it's not enough just to make Aliyah and go to university in Hebrew University. Rather, I'm going to work the land itself. So she made Aliyah and volunteered to go to an agricultural training school in Moshev Nahalal to work the land. Now, the letters she sends home to her mother are hilarious because she talks about how this girl who literally grew up with a maid is now feeding the cows and mucking with the pigs and planting seeds in the land of Israel and getting dark brown from the sun and manual physical labor. It's something that her mother would have, or Hannah herself would have never imagined in her wildest dreams just a couple of years earlier. It's what Aleph Dad Gordon called labor Zionism. If you're already gonna to go to the land, then you should work the land as well. So this is an incredible decision that Hannah Senesh makes to leave that bourgeoisie background behind and go and work the land. Do you think, wow, that is incredible. And she does something even beyond that. When it came time to emigrate, to leave the course, when she graduated, sorry, she chose rather than join an established kibbutz, she was gonna go with a bunch of youngsters and found a new kibbutz on the shores of the Mediterranean called Stortiam, or the fields of the sea. Now, when you go there today, it's beautiful. It's right next to Caesarea. There's lovely gr grass, and they even have an amazing uh, thing called Kefiam, which is like all these water activities there. And it's a stunning kibbutz. But if you looked at it through Hannah Senesh's eyes, it was literally a bunch of tents on sand dunes. And she decides this cultured, educated Hungarian girl, you can't always say, let someone else do it. If it's the right thing to do, you've got to do it yourself. For her to do was to do wasn't to talk about it, it was to do it. So wow, here's this woman who's made two amazing decisions. By the way, she only got out by the skin of her teeth to Israel itself just before the war was declared on the 1st of September, 1939. And after finishing the halal, she goes to found a new kibbutz. Now her life would have finished there founding a new kibbutz. You think this is an amazing chalutza, an amazing pioneer, but one step further. Here's a quote from a poem she wrote. The voice called and I went. I went because the voice called. 
So what voice is Hannah talking about? And by the way, I'm just gonna take a, a brief break here and just talk generally. Um, our eternity are made out of three things. One is our Yiladim, our children. One is our Masim Tovim, our good deeds. And the last part of eternity, of course, is what we create. That's what lives after us, whether it's art or poetry or writing. And in Hannah's case, we know so much about her because of what she wrote, both in the form of poetry and in the form of her diary as well. So a lot of these quotes I'm giving you are all directly either from her poetry or from her diary, which she, from 1938, started writing in Hebrew with spelling mistakes of a new immigrant with Nola. Even her famous song, Eli, Eli, Shaloi Gemeh Eli Olam, she wrote the word Le Olam with an Aleph instead of an Ayin. I've seen the original diary, the manuscript, and it's amazing to think that uh, she made the same mistake many new immigrants make with the Aleph and the Ayin. Let's get back to this poem. A voice called and I went. I went because the voice called. What voice is she talking about? What is she talking about? First of all, before we talk about the poem, let's look at this picture. It's a very famous picture of Hannah in uniform, and everyone assumes that's her uniform in the British Army. For anyone who served in the British Army, such as my grandfather, I served in the Israeli Army, we know this is not in a British Army uniform. It's just a make-believe costume. In fact, this is Hannah Senesh's Purim costume in her last Purim in Budapest before she made Aliyah. It's also foreshadowing maybe what she was going to do, though she didn't know. And this is just a poem costume. Her actual army uniform, you see in the next page, here she is as a lieutenant in the Royal Air Force of Great Britain in a British army uniform. This is a picture of her in uniform itself. So what was the voice that called? Hannah Senesh basically was safe in Europe and she was writing to her mom and they were corresponding. And suddenly the letters stopped. And all people living in the British Mandate to Palestine found the communication with their families in occupied Europe dwindled to nothing. And then rumors started coming. And then the rumors became facts as people started understanding exactly what the final solution was. People managed, the words came in, people survived, two people escaped from Auschwitz, people witnessed Eisen's group killings, and people understood there was a mass slaughter of Jews going on in Europe. Now, the Jews of Palestine did what they could do. They in mass joined the British army. By the end of the war, there was even a, a Jewish brigade in the British army that fought in uh, Northern Italy. My late grandfather fought in the Eighth Army, in the British Eighth Army, and he fought in North Africa with Montgomery and he fought in Italy. And he met the, uh, the boys of the Jewish brigade and said, these guys were super motivated. Most of them spoke German. And a lot of them understood they had actually had family trapped in Europe and they were the most motivated fighters fighting against the Nazis. So that's one thing the Jews of Palestine did. They joined the British army en masse. The other thing uh, they could do, of course, was uh, to carry on trying to smuggle the British, pass the British white papers to smuggle Jews in. Now, the same British government uh, that was fighting the Germans was also ironically being accessories to murder by at the time when the Jews needed them the most, uh, severely curtailing Jewish immigration from Nazi occupied Europe. So even if you could escape, the Royal Navy, rather than have all of its ships fighting the Germans, still patrol the coast of Palestine during World War II to stop Jews coming in. So on one hand, some Jews stood, stayed behind and formed what was called Ali Abed, illegal immigration to help the Jews uh, come in. And the other hand, many Jews joined the British service. And David Ben-Goyen famously said in 1939, when the war started, we will fight the white paper as if there's no Hitler, and we'll fight Hitler as if there's no white paper. So the Jews did both. Hannah heard that the British were looking for European Jews who spoke the languages of Central Europe, Czech, Hungarian, German, to go behind enemy lines to rescue downed Allied pilots. The Jewish agency, the pre-war quasi-government institution led by Ben-Gurion, said to the British, we have those people. We will provide you with people who uh, can speak the languages, and you can train the military on one condition. Once they finish doing what they need to do for the Royal Air Force, we need them afterwards to be in Europe to help our people in Europe as well, the Jewish, their Jewish brothers and sisters. And the, the, the British agreed, the Jewish agency agreed, and Hannah joined a select group of people, volunteered, boys and girls, 
who all volunteered for this incredibly dangerous mission to parachute into Nazi-occupied Europe. And in fact, theirs was the only Jewish rescue mission led by Jews in the entire World War II of the Allied forces. Now, Hannah wasn't the only woman on this mission. Buried next to Mount Herzl is another woman called Chaviva Reich. Less is known about her, uh, even though she was the same age, simply because she didn't do what Hannah did. She didn't write. There was no diary. There was no poems. And that's why we know so much about Hannah. So let me just recap again. Hannah Senesh has made a few brave decisions. A, she's left Hungary to go to Israel. B, she's gone to an agricultural training school. B, C, sorry, she's gone to found a new kibbutz, Dot Yam, and D, she's gone to, even though she's now safe, she's volunteered to go back into Nazi occupied Europe to try and warn the last great Jewish community that had yet been touched by the Nazis. And that was, of course, her own community of Hungary. In 1944, when she went on her mission, uh, her mission started training in January 44. 830,000 Jews were still living in Hungary. It was the last great Jewish community that had yet been touched by the Nazis. It wasn't directly occupied by the Nazis. There was a collaboration government there of, of uh, Marshal Horthy, and the Jews were still safe, but the writing was on the wall. They were living in a total obliv um, ignorance of the fate of their brothers and sisters in the rest of occupied Europe. And she wanted to go and warn them about their fate. When she was asked why she's going on this dangerous mission by one of the kibbutz members, she answered him with two words in Hebrew, which is wordplay. She said, Ani olechet bishvil ami ve'imi. She said, I'm going for my nation and for my mother. She also wanted to warn her mother and get her mother, who was still in Budapest, who she hadn't heard from for quite a while, and also warn the relevant Jewish authorities of what would happen if there was a direct Nazi occupation of Hungary. So here's this picture of Hannah Senesh on the eve of the Holocaust. Many left Europe for Palestine to save themselves. Very few went back to save others. Incredible, Monsieur Woodnevich, incredible bravery. Now, I wanted to show you this picture before we break for a brief film clip. The, there are three pictures here, two we've seen already. The third one is what I wanted to talk about. We saw this picture of Hannah in Purim, in, in her Purim costume as a soldier. We saw this picture of Hannah in, in a Moshav Nahalal. This last picture for me is one of the most poignant pictures. It's the only picture we have of Hannah and her beloved brother, George, or George, he was called in English, in the land of Israel. Now, when the war started, uh, he was studying in France, in Paris, um, in Paris, France. And uh, even though it was occupied by the Germans, he managed to escape and uh, through illegal immigration, eventually get to the land of Israel in March 1944. He met with his sister and to total surprise and shock, she was dressed in a real Air Force uniform. And he's like, what's going on? And he, she didn't tell him exactly what she was going to do the next day, which is travel down to Egypt with her, with her group of uh, fellow trained Palmach soldiers to get ready to parachute into Europe. She didn't tell him. Why she didn't tell him, we're going to discuss after this film clip. And they met and they spent a beautiful day together. And uh, there was a guy taking pictures and she randomly said, hey, can you take a picture of me and my brother? And he said, sure. And she scribbled down uh, his address where he was staying, the brother. And that's how we have this picture. It's the only picture. Little did George know when he's holding his sister's hand over here, after finally making the land of Israel, this would be the first and only time he would meet his sister in the land of Israel, and she was about to go on a mission which he wouldn't return from. An incredibly uh, poignant uh, picture. And in the corner over here, Blessed is a Match, which is the title of one of the poems she wrote, in fact, the last poem she wrote before she crossed into Hungary. And it's also the title of an incredible documentary film, which we're going to see an excerpt from uh, after I, when I give the word, a two minute excerpt from it. This film is actually made with both documentary footage, archival footage, also by interviewing people who knew Hannah when she was alive and was narrated by the late Sir Martin Gilbert, the famed British historian, a beautiful narration. And amongst the questions he asked is, was Hannah Senator's mission a success or a failure? So let's go over to this uh, clip from the movie Blessed is a Match. It was made by Spielberg, the other Spielberg, 
That's the sister of Stephen, Nancy, who makes incredible Zionistic films. She made another one about the uh, Americans and British who volunteered for the Israeli Air Force uh, in 1948. Um, and she made this film about Hannah Senesh as well, a beautiful film, uh, both the reenactments and of course the interviews of people who knew Hannah as well. So let's go over to Dima, Dima who's gonna put on the film for two minutes. Uh, yes, I will try just uh, uh, stop sharing your screen and I will share mine, please. Thank you. Okay, so I'll stop mine, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perhaps it's madness. Perhaps it is dangerous. There are times when one is commanded to do something, even at the price of one's life. The parachuters would have the mission to make contact with the Jews of Hungary, find means of rescuing them, find means of stimulating resistance. In the mountains, one hears the question, whom shall I send? And the answer, send me. Suddenly, Hannah and I realized that we were surrounded with no means of escape. Hannah threw her arms around my neck, sobbing. Mother, forgive me. Hannah Senesh understood small gestures can mean very big things. She understood what one person can do. She was such a combination of courage and gentleness. I don't want to spoil the image of our Jeanne d'Arc, but I didn't like her. I admired her. Hundreds of millions of Europeans were captive peoples. And here was this little group who said, we're going to try to do something. The courage, the poetry, the dream combined in one person. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the secret fastness of the heart. Blessed is the heart with strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. You. Okay. Okay. So, can you guys see my screen again now? All right. Cool. So that was an incredible documentary. I well recommend you guys getting it. You can get it on a Amazon Movie. Plenty of different ways. It's a beautiful film. And also, a book came out for the film, which you get Amazon. Blessed is the match, which is Hannah's full diary and all her poems as well as well as an amazing selection of archival photos, uh, many never before seen. Uh, and uh, as Martin Gilbert, as the late Sir Martin Gilbert asked about their mission, was it a success or was it a failure? In the traditional sense of success and failure it was a total utter failure. She did not rescue one Jew and herself got caught and unfortunately uh, killed just before the end of the war as well. But from a, another way of looking at it, what she did is she gave hope. She showed that here's a small bunch of Jews from the land of Israel who's gonna come out and they're gonna do whatever they can to try and change the course of history. And we learn from this, you should never say, well, I'm just one person, what can I do? You should say, I'm one person and I'm gonna make a difference. And just before she crossed the border into Hungary, she turned around, by the way, they'd already been in Central Europe in Yugoslavia for a couple of months and they had succeeded in rescuing downed Allied pilots. So that part of the mission was a total success. And some of them stayed in Yugoslavia. Before she crossed the border into Hungary, she turned around and gave to one of the guys who was staying behind, who was interviewed in that film clip, a scrumpled piece of paper. She said, if I don't come back, make sure my friends get this piece of paper and they open my suitcases on the kibbutz and see what's inside on my camp bed in the tent. And that scrumpled piece of paper, he said, why is he giving me a piece of paper? She was going to Hungary and he threw it into the wood and walked away. And about an hour later, he's like, you know what, maybe there's something important. And he went back and he's rummaging around, he found this piece of paper, and that was the poem, Blessed is the Match, Ashrei Hegafor, which even though she didn't know it, she was writing her own eulogy. An American uh, 
Native American culture, there's something called a life song. It's before you die, if you know you're going to die, you write your own eulogy. It's called a life song. In Hannah Senesha's case, she wrote a poem which starts, Asherei HaGafor, Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. So if you enter a dark, dark room and you light one match, that small match can fill the whole room with light. And Hannah Senesh and her companions were parachuting into the dark night of Nazi-occupied Europe, and their small beacons is what lit up the night. And we learn in, in the, the book of Proverbs, in Mishle, there's a sentence, Ner Hashem nishmat adam, that the candle of God is the soul of man. We all have this spark inside us, and Hannah Senesh's spark, and the spark of the others who died on this mission as well, is still a light for us today. And she also wrote in another poem, uh, when the night is at the darkest, the stars that have gone seem the brightest. And Hannah Senesh, even now, all these years later, her legacy still shines brightly amongst us. Now, why don't I know a bit of background story? This is a picture of me when I was doing my PhD next to this chap over here. His name is David Senesh, Professor David Senesh. And I'm sure many of you have said, wait a second, Hannah Senesh, David Senesh, there must be a connection. And there is. So he's coming to give a lecture. He's a world famous trauma psychologist. He deals especially with, uh, with um, post uh, trauma from a, from a military point of view. Um, and I saw he was coming to give a lecture at our uni and I saw David Senesh from Haifa, Israel. So I went up to him before and said, hey, are you related to Hannah Senesh? He said, actually, I'm her nephew. And it's his father, George, who was her brother. And he, we sat and we spoke, we have a friendship, we still communicate to this day. I wrote an article about him. You're welcome after this if you want to go to the Times of Israel blogs to look up an article called Being David Senesh. And you can read about that interview I, I had with him. But amongst the crazy things he told me was why his father thought that Hannah never told him that she was going to go on this mission the next day. And the answer his father said to him is if she would have told me what she was going to do, I would have talked her out of it. I would have said, there's no way a bunch of kids who are like 21, 22 years old from, from Palestine are going to make any difference to the war and you're probably going to get yourself killed. And he was such a persuasive talker and they were so incredibly close that she didn't tell him for fear that he would talk out of it. A very, very poignant recollection. And, um, and his father, George, lived until his 90s, as did Hannah's mother, Katerina, uh, Catherine Senesh, and they spent the rest of their lives uh, promoting their sister's or daughter's legacy. So it was a very, very poignant and sad life as well, uh, surrounded by memories of his, of his famous sister. And to make things even more crazy, Hannah died in prison. David Senesh, her nephew in the Yom Kippur War, was captured by the Egyptians. And his father got the message that his son was missing in action on the Egyptian front. And he almost had a total uh, emotional and physical breakdown. He thought, how much can one family give? I lost my sister fighting for the Jewish Zionist cause. And now my own son is missing in action. Lucky uh, David survived the, the imprisonment by the Egyptians. And he said, one of the things that helped him survive and he was talking to me was thinking about his aunt and how brave she was and how she would have reacted and it kept him alive and kept him sane. And he said, if I ever get out of this alive, I'm gonna devote my life to um, understanding and helping other people who've been through military stress and, and trauma. And that's what he is today, David Senesh. Uh, a very, very uh, interesting and intimate behind the scenes look at another member of Hannah Senesh's family. Um, of course, the song we heard at the beginning of this performance, I'm going to wrap up in a couple of minutes, we'll have some time for some Q&A as well before the uh, musical uh, performance at the end as well. We have a sandwich music performance at the beginning and at the end. The song we heard at the beginning is the famous song that we always, that all the youth movements teach their participants, um, and that is the Eli Eli. Now again, how do we know so much about Hannah? Because after she was killed, uh, this guy got back to uh, Israel and told her the Chavarim on the kibbutz about her suitcase. They opened it up and they found her diary and they found her poems. No one even knew then that she was writing poetry, except for maybe her mother, a few close friends. And her poetry was published. 
So by the time her body, which had initially been buried in Budapest, was brought to Israel in 1950, she was already a heroine throughout the whole land of Israel. And the streets of Israel literally were lined with tens of thousands of people to escort her body from the last, her last resting place on Mount Herzl itself. Um, and this is a poem she wrote just before the mission when she was still in Israel. And I think it's a beautiful poem because it sums up also how she felt being in Israel and why she felt it was necessary to go to Europe. We gathered flowers, again, she wrote this in Hebrew. We gathered flowers in the fields, in the mountains. We breathed the fresh winds of spring. We were washed with the heat of the sun's rays in our homeland, in a lovable home, capital H. That's how she felt escaping war-torn Europe. And look at the second stanza. We go to brothers in diaspora, in the suffering of winter, in darkness and frost. Our heart will bring the message of springtime. Our lips will sing the song of light. What a beautiful poem where she associates Israel with spring and with light and the diaspora with darkness. And Europe indeed became one huge graveyard for the Jewish people. And like a phoenix arising from the ashes, the Jewish homeland was formed because of brave young men and women like Hannah, just three years after the end of the greatest tragedy of the Jewish people. Hannah initially was buried in Budapest. And here I am guiding a group in Budapest in the cemetery there. And um, there's now a marker where her grave originally was in Hebrew and in Hungarian over here. Um, it's the only Tzahal IDF grave marker in the cemetery in Budapest. Uh, and in 1951, as I mentioned, her body was reinterred in Israel, is now on Mount Herzl. And uh, because it was before there was an IDF, it doesn't have an IDF symbol on it. It has a symbol of the pre-war Haganah. Uh, and it says, Hannah Senich, the daughter of Katerina and Bella. Chabirat Kesare, she belonged to the Kesare Kibbutz. She was born in Hungary. And the date she was born in 1921. And she, um, died in 1943, in 1944, and um, she went on Shlichut Ha'am Le'eretz Oyev. She went as an emissary, as a messenger from her, of the nation, of her nation, of the nation, the nation of the Jewish people, to the land of the enemy, and was uh, murdered in Budapest. Now, what's interesting, in case you hadn't noticed the original publicity of this uh, poster, Initially said she was killed by Nazis. That's what most people erroneously think. In reality, the Nazis had left Hungary in October of 1944, and she was actually killed by her own countrymen, by the Hungarian Arrow Cross, who were fascists. She was killed literally two days before the Soviets reached Budapest. You could hear the sound of the Soviet cannon on the outskirts of Budapest, and um, her own Hungarian people dragged her out. She refused to drive blindfold and looking at the sky in this, on this same date, 76 years ago, Hannah entered, all, Hannah entered eternity. Now again, we don't ask in Judaism how long you live, we ask what you did with the life that you live. And in Hannah's case, she packed her short life of 22 years, packed with meaning. And the real definition of a hero is not someone who thinks of themselves, but someone who's selfless. Every single decision that Hannah made from the age of 16 onwards was what is good for the Jewish people? What is good for the Jewish homeland? That's why she made Aliyah. That's why she went to work on Moshev Nahalal. That's why she went to found a kibbutz. That's why she went on her last mission. All of this because she was asked one simple question. The voice called, I'm gonna answer that voice. What is good for the Jewish people? What is good for the Jewish homeland? And as we pay tribute to her, we don't talk about her death, we celebrate her life, a life well lived. She didn't say, I'm one person, what can I do? Because I'm one person, I'm gonna make a difference. And here we are 76 years later, celebrating her life, celebrating her heroism and still being inspired by it and by the light that she still shines to us. Because when the night is the darkest, that's when the beginning of the dawn is. And in this case, the dawn was a new light will shine on Zion, the light of the Jews returning to their homeland because of the bravery of these pioneers who fought, revived our language, and rebuilt our homeland.
Yehi zichra baruch. May her memory be for a blessing. So we have questions. Yes. Thank you so much. What a, 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 an in-depth, emotional, and great, a greater understanding of Hannah Senesh than I think most of us had. And what a, one, what a wonderful display of heroism, uh, especially seeing it through your eyes. Um, thank, thank you so much for that. We've got a few questions. Before we go back to a little bit of music, I hope you don't mind. We have a few questions. A couple of people no, want to know what happened. If you can, and tell us what you know. Um, just mm -hmm. what, what happened with the rest of the family. Um, one of the questions specifically was, uh, how did the mother and brother survive the war? Um, did she meet her mother in prison in Budapest? Um, if you can elaborate on all those things, that, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, sure, no problem. Gien problema. Okay, so basically, <laughs> uh, she basically said uh, her brother, as I mentioned, managed by Ali Abed, very rare it was to get into Israel illegally in 1944. The British were pretty good at stopping people getting in, so during the Holocaust getting in. There was an infamous ship called the Sturmer, which actually sank because the British wouldn't allow it to come in and with one survivor. Uh, so her brother got into Israel in 1944, met her that one day we talked about. Her mother, believe it or not, once she was captured, she, she was captured the day she crossed into Hungary, right? Um, and she was captured by Hungarians who handed her over to the Gestapo. Uh, and the Gestapo realized that she was Hungarian. And they realized her mother was there and they brought her mother into the Gestapo prison in Budapest and said, if you don't tell us all the British military codes and what your mission was, we're gonna uh, kill your mother. And she refused to. Her mother barely recognized her. The Gestapo tortured her already. They knocked her teeth out. Uh, she was really brutalized and she refused to. And her mother was actually kept in the same cell as Hannah for a while. And then when the Germans left, the mother was released, but not Hannah, because the Hungarian Arab Cross was still in control of Budapest. So after the war, uh, in fact, the Hungarian Arab Cross told her there was a court martial for Hannah by the Hungarian fascists. And she defended herself beautifully and eloquently. And the mother was told to come to hear the final session of the court martial, but the Hungarians had decided enough was enough and just took her out and summarily executed her. So the mother actually got to the prison to hear the last session. Her daughter was already dead in the courtyard, but she found in her pocket, she left her last letter in her coat and she was buried in the Jewish cemetery in um, Budapest. And in 1951, her grave, her body was, her remains were brought to Israel, and the mother made Aliyah with her daughter's remains, lived there for the rest of a very long life. Her and and a further question. Had, yeah. One last thing is her son, sorry, her brother George had two, two sons, uh, one David, we talked about the professor, another one called, um, I'm trying to remember his name second, uh, Eitan, Eitan Senesh. Both of them really, they, they had the archives of Hannah's writings and poetry, and they made it their life's mission to make sure that their famous aunt was well known. And David had a daughter and he called her Hagar, not Hannah, because Hagar was Hannah's code name on her mission. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, and, and Hannah's father, there's a question whether, uh, you, if you know, if he was a playwright and was as well known yeah. in Hungary. He was super, his name was Bela Senesh. He was incredibly famous uh, amongst Hungarians. I mean, everyone had heard of him, but unfortunately he was, kind of was six when, when he died. He died very young, tragically young, but he'd made a fortune from his plays and that's why she could live so comfortably off the earnings of his writing. And that might've also explained the writing gene she had, maybe she got it from her dad. Um, let's talk a little bit about how Hannah's legacy survives in Israel. Um, firstly, there, there is a question whether um, any streets are named after, well, Hannah, other, other famous women, um, um, surely Hannah Senesh and Golda Meir would be the first ones. It's Hannah Senesh, I think there is a street, but you, you tell us if you know. Um, and secondly, on an educational basis, is Hannah learned in schools, in education in schools in Israel? Of course, um, there's almost every Israeli town has a Hana Senesh street. Uh, there's also uh, towns named after as well, such as Pardes Hana as well, Hana's Orchard. 
There's an entire school in Brooklyn named after the Hannah Senich Day School in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and her name and her legacy are well known. Her poetry, her writings are studied both in Israel and Jewish, uh, in Israeli schools and also in the diaspora in Jewish day schools as well. She's left a legacy through her words and her poetry and action that's just as strong today as it was in 1950, when her body was brought in 1950 to Israel. Almost the entire country came to a standstill and she was given a full state uh, burial and funeral. And that passion for her words and for her passion and her actions has not dulled in the almost eight decades since. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal. And then finally, just the, one last question, if I may. Um, in Hungary, is she celebrated at all? Is she renowned? Is she known? Is she at all famous? Yeah, so I, in addition to guiding groups in Israel as a tour guide, I also do take groups to Eastern Europe as well, to, to Poland, the Czech Republic, and Budapest. And in Budapest itself, there's a massive memorial for Hannah in the Jewish cemetery, uh, where initially where she was buried. Uh, there's also a street named after her as well in Hungary. And you can actually see the site of her house on the Pest side of the river. And basically, um, She's very well known, but she's actually known interestingly by her Hungarian name, which was Aniko. Uh, we all assume she was Hanna or Hanna, but her given name was actually Aniko. And so in Hungary, they refer to her as Aniko Senes with a Z for the Senes as opposed to the SH. So she is well known, uh, she is studied, and she's also admired as well, especially as a role model to young females as well. That's, that's, that's interesting and that's great to know. Um, um, specifically from, from people living in Israel. So, Dr. Tuvia Book, thank you. Thank you for allowing thank us you. in, for allowing us to share with you, alongside with you, a little bit about Israel's legacies, Israel's heroines, um, and a little bit more about us feeling a little bit closer to Israel itself. Thank you so much for allowing us to do that this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to, from the from the deepest parts of the ZF and the WZO, thank Dr. Tuvia Book for taking his time. And if I can please recommend Dr. Tuvia uh, for tour guides, as, as you heard, not just in Israel, but also around Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, what a phenomenal tour guide he is. And please contact, if you need his details, contact us directly or the WZO, and, and, and we will certainly uh, put you in contact with, with Dr. Book. Um, I would also absolutely like to thank the WZO for making this evening happening and the ZF alongside who, who, who supported in this. I am Paul Charney, Chairman of the Zionist Federation. I wanna thank you for joining and staying in touch with us. And now for a little bit more entertainment than you've seen for certainly from me, uh, I'd like to reintroduce Yuval and Noah to, to, to help us enjoy this evening emotionally. Thank you so much and good night. Hello everybody. Thank you very much. That was very um, interesting and enlightening. Um, we are going to start with a couple of songs um, that were written by Hana. The, the words were written by Hana. The first one is Ashreya Gafur, um, which I know Tuvia mentioned. And the other one is called Lu Bata, if you, if, if you Came, uh, which Hana wrote about uh, an imaginary um, meet with her brother that was serving at the time that she hasn't seen for a long time. So the first song is Ashrei Agafu, and it's the same like the, what you've seen. You showed to be showed about the film, uh, the blessing of the uh, match. Right? Match, yes. Yeah. So that's of course the Hebrew version, original version, I believe. Here we go. <laughs> אשרי הלהבה שבערה בסתרי לבבות אשרי הלבבות שידעו לחדול בכבוד אשרי הגפור שנשרף והצית להבות
שנשרף, שנשרף, והצית, והצית להבות. אשרי הלהבה שבערה בסתרי לבבות. אשרי הלבבות שידעו לחדול בכבוד. אשרי הגפור שנשרף והצית להבות. So it's actually the um, next song, um, as uh, Tuvia uh, actually told about her brother, and this song is called Lu Bata. Uh, if you would come, so I guess <laughs> I probably would need some answers from Tuvia maybe in the chat, because I uh, understand she did meet him just like a day before she went to um, Europe, uh, before her mission. And this song is a wishing, longing to see, uh, kind of imagining seeing her brother. So I wish if uh, probably she did write it before um, when he was in Paris, I guess. So to be, maybe you can answer on the chat. But mean, meanwhile, we're going to it's a beautiful uh, song we, me and Noah, just discovered lately. And here it goes, Lubata, if you would come, my brother, and I would be so glad to see you. Something like that in <laughs> very uh, brief English here. Uh -huh. One second, thank you. <sighs> ידיים בכיס וצחוק בעיניים וצליל פסיעותיך בקצב מוכר הייתי עומדת נדהמת נבהלת לאור החזון הנפלא היקר עד התפרץ תמונתך תפיל כל כותלי הספקות בתוכי תניף ותעיף זרועותיי לחבקך בצחוק ובדמה אחי אחי פתאום לנגדי ברחוב, ידיים בכיס וצחוק בעיניים, וצליל פסיעותיך בקצב מוכר, הייתי עומדת נבהלת, נדהמת לאור. תפיל כל כותלי הספקות בתוכי, תניף ותעיף זרועותיי לחבקך בצחוק ובדמה, אחי, אחי. Um, the next song is Shir HaPartizanim HaYehudim, is the partisan song. Um, I know that they've met um, some partisans on the, I mean, I'm sure actually you've discussed it or you've already talked about it and you know about it. So we're just going to sing it. So originally, I'm, I don't know what language, definitely. Uh, I think it was in say. Russian originally, yes. I believe. And it has a Yiddish version and this is the Hebrew version. Yeah, and us kids uh, uh, growing in Israel, um, and you have Yom HaShoah, that is uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. This is kind of a very traditional uh, song to sing. Here we go. Yeah, it has a lot of verses. We're only going to do a few. <laughs> Anatomar hine darki ha'achrona 
את אור היום הסתירו שמי העננה. זה יום נחשפנו לה עוד יעל ויבוא, ומצעדינו עוד ירעים אנחנו פה. זה יום נחשפנו לה עוד יעל ויבוא, ומצעדינו עוד ירעים אנחנו פה. מארץ התמר עד ירכתי כפורים אנחנו פה במחאובות וייסורים ובאשר טיפת דמנו שם נגרע הלא ינוב עוד עוז רוחנו בגבורה ובאשר טיפת דמנו שם נגרע הלא ינוב עוד עוז רוחנו בגבורה את אור היום הסתירו שמי העננה זה יום נחשפנו לו עוד יעל ויבוא ומצעדנו עוד ירעים אנחנו פה זה יום נחשפנו לו עוד יעל ויבוא ומצעדנו עוד ירעים אנחנו Okay, some of these songs, I think that the Hebrew speakers will know very well. This one is called Eretz Eretz. Uh, please sing along, but keep your um, mic on mute. <laughs> but do sing along. <laughs> שמש לה כדבש וחלב. ארץ בה נולדנו, ארץ בה נחיה, ונשב בה יהיה מה שיהיה. ארץ שנאהב, היא לנו אם ואב. ארץ של ופרחים וילדים בלי סוף. בצפון כנרת, בדרום חולות, ומזרח למערב נושק גבולות. ארץ שנוהב, היא לנו אם ואב. ארץ של... Somebody, will you try to talk to us? No? <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. 
All right, next song is uh, really uh, was a big hit uh, long days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Before the foundation. It was a huge hit in Israel, but it was also a huge hit in the United States, I believe. Yeah, loads of loads of folky versions. We'll give you ours with a bit of a, a mix of something thrown in for good measure. But your mic is on, but thank you. I turned it on especially to clap. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you too. I love that. Unmute for clap. Just don't forget to mute it when okay, we're singing. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we will be cut. But thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Um, Thank 
נכון, וואו, we have a wonderful song now. That's a song that actually is not as old, it's only from probably after the, probably from the 60s, um, about parachuters, the parachuters. Yeah, it's the song of a paratrooper, yes. basically. And um, yeah, so it was written well after, but we figured it does kind of fit with the subject. So we're going to sing it to you in our own um, little version. Yeah. ראית אותו במטוס הממריא, תחתיו נפרסים, פרדסים וכפרים. הוא חש את מסע המצנח על גבו, אוחז ברצועות וחושב בליבו. הנה עוד דקה, והרוח תחבוט על פניי. הנה עוד דקה, ייפתח המצנח מעליי. כשיפתח עליי, כשיפתח את העולם כולו אשכח אני לבד והמצנח שיפתח, שיפתח, שיפתח עליי, עליי It's a very, actually, it's an old song. Very, very old. Times of Hannah Senesh. And speaking about Yam Kineret, Kineret Gassiaf Galili. And someone just sits down, a, a good uh, student for Torah, I think, yes? Yeah. He learns Torah on, on the... On the banks on the of banks the Kineret. Of Kineret, yes. Lovely, lovely, actually, one. Uh,
are we doing over there? How many people are still with us? Should we go on? Should we stop? Still 114? Go to bed. <laughs> it's not so late here as it is over there. It's another very, very famous Israeli song where I expect anybody who knows it will be singing along at home. who's watching in Israel. <laughs> this has been the longest I've ever been away. Um, what should we do? We'll meet again. It feels like we should do we'll meet again now. So uh, this is very on topic because this is from the same era. Very, very famous song. And all I can wish us, those who are far, and even those who are near but we can't see because of the current situation, we can only see them on Zoom. Um, I should hope that we'll all meet again. Yuval needs to check something. So of course, uh, maybe we have to Made, again. made famous by Vera Lynn, yes. who, who passed away sadly quite recently actually. Just Ago. Yeah. And also to mention, of course, as you heard before, Hanna Semesh was actually a British soldier, so... This is the, the song of, of the, the troops. the culture of the British soldier and of the whole, uh, I guess, allies from World War II. And uh, here we go. We'll meet again, don't know where. Sunny day, keep smiling through, just like you always do, till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. So will you please say hello to the folks that I know, tell them I won't be
again Don't know where, don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day And you can't really feel, you, can't, you don't know what the audience are doing. Just switch the mute on at the end just to clap and switch it off again. It's okay. Virtual claps are, are, are most, most welcome. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Are we going to do one in That's Hebrew or one in English? Yitzchak. I'm going to let Yitzchak. Yitzchak Sonnenschein from, the, from my Sadrut. Can you tell us what song would you like for, for the, as last song? Do you have any requests? Is he there? Is he writing? Okay. Uh, we can do that. Or now, uh, now, uh, if you haven't. Now had you hear me? Yes. Now you hear me? Can. Ah, okay. Take the best one. <laughs> the, the best one, not Alomiti. <laughs> and it's the World Zionist Organization in English. Uh, the Royal Zionist Organization. So choose the best one that you think so about. No, Bona says it bridge, Kilo Mountain. Louis Eulai. Louis, Bona says she's a lot of Jim Angelano, and I'm a kid at Louis. I'm a kid at Louis. Tom, I'm a kid at Louis. Tom, הייתי בת ארבע ידעתי את כל המילים, שזה עכשיו כבר פחות. עוד יש מפרס לבן באופק מול ענן שחור כבד כל שנבקש לו יהי ואם בחלונות הערב אור נרות החג רועד כל שנבקש 
שנבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי. כל שנבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי. כל שנבקש לו יהי. כל ענות אני שומע, כל שופר וכל תופים, כל שנבקש לו יהי. לו תישמע בתוך כל אלה, גם תפילה אחת מפי, כל שנבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי. שנבקש לו יהי, לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי, כל שנבקש לו יהי. ואם פתאום יזרח מאופל על ראשנו אור כוכב, כל שנבקש לו יהי. אז תן שלווה ותן גם כוח לכל אלה שנאהב, כל שנבקש לו יהי. לו יהי, לו יהי, אנא לו יהי, כל שנבקש לו יהי. that it should go on the list really <laughs> thank you very much thank you everybody you thanks for staying with us so i'm going to look at all the can i look at all the comments when it's done Noah Bodner and Yuval Hafki. it was one of the most touching and exciting evenings that we had in all our zoom lectures that we make so many of them and really i was i'm so happy and proud that we brought you here to give us a little of the taste from what Hannah Senesh left us after her brave light. So please be with us in the other lectures. But this evening was a wonderful and remember uh, evening. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you, Yitzhak. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. It was beautiful.